What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another episode of Get Ready With Me, which is my book club here on this makeup channel. Today we are discussing chapters 23 through 50 of A Court of Wings and Ruin. If you are not caught up on this series or if you're not caught up on the story, I will leave a link in the description down below to all of the previous videos in a playlist. So if you want to just catch up on that, and it'll also have all the information about the books we've read up until now to get you caught up to this point in the story if that's the way you want to do it. As far as the makeup in today's video is concerned, I will be using the Melt Smoke Sessions palette. I did a three looks video with this palette. If you are looking for a proper tutorial with this, I'll link that up here. You might find that more helpful today. It's just gonna kind of be get ready with me style. That's why it's called get ready with me. You know, you know what I mean? Get it. I decided to pick this up again, first of all, because I am on a Melt Cosmetics kick lately. The eyeshadows are, mm, mm. And I only used this in one video so far and I felt like it could use another moment in the spotlight. So today this is what I'm going to be using on my eyes. As always, I will list every single product that I use in this get ready with me in order in the description down below. And I'll also put a little card up on the screen so you guys know what I'm using as I use it if you wanna follow along. Before we get into the story and the makeup, please don't forget to leave a like on this video because it's very, very helpful. And I, oh God, do I ever appreciate it. And also if you are new around here, do you like books? Do you like makeup? Do you like just makeup? Because that's mostly what we do. If any of these things apply to you, then you should probably subscribe because why not? I'm filming this way in advance. So when this goes up, I'm actually going to be out of town. So if I'm a little slower than usual getting back to your comments, that is why, but I will get back to them eventually or at least do my best to try. I think that's all we need to get out of it before we get started. So let's do a little bit of makeup with the Smoke Sessions palette and start at chapter 23 of A Court of Wings and Ruin. I brought a snack today. I'm gonna finish them before I even started filming. So where we left off, Feyre and Cassian had gone to the prison to meet with the Bone Carver to see if the Bone Carver would be willing to fight on their side in the war in exchange for her possibly freeing him from the prison the way that Amran freed herself from the prison. And when she brought it up to him, his first response was, I'm listening. As it turns out, the Bone Carver actually doesn't want to be freed and sent back to his world because he thinks that after all this time, there's probably not much left of his world anyway. And to be freed to just roam around the earth would not be beneficial to him because he is very much afraid of his sister and his brother who are death gods, just like he is. His sister is the weaver of the wood. But what he would like is to be able to see the world from inside his prison cell. So what he asks for is a very old magic mirror called the Ouroboros. Sounds simple enough, right? Just go get me this old ass mirror and I'll be good to go. However, any person or any fairy who has ever tried to look into it, which would be quite necessary for going to retrieve it, has gone completely bad from what they see when they look into it. When they get back to the house, Feyre wants to visit with both Elaine and Lucian. Elaine has been speaking in like, these weird sort of half riddle type things. So Vera is in the family library with her sisters, listening to Elaine talk in these strange riddles and Lucian comes in. Now Lucian was told not to come up there and be near her sisters, but Vera wants to see how this goes down because Lucian is Elaine's mate and they haven't really interacted with one another at all yet. And she's kind of hopeful, although Nesta seems like she just wants Lucian to go away, that Lucian will be able to be helpful for Elaine in her healing process, sort of the way Reese was helpful for her. So when Lucian comes in, she throws up a magic shield to make sure that he can't hear that they're there. And then she uses her magic mental powers to invade his mind and read his thoughts as he's talking to Elaine. While she's in his mind, she sees that he handed over all of the information about his father's court to Azrael during their meeting. He feels like this is a good sign that she can trust him more fully, but she's not 100% there yet. So Elaine seems to know that she's got some type of a connection to Lucian, but she doesn't really know who he is. And when he explains who he is, she remembers that he was in Highburn with them and that he betrayed them. And at that point, 
Feyre is super concerned about all of the nonsensical things that Elaine is saying and her general state of being. And so she insists that she moves them down to the townhouse in order to get them a little less isolated and kind of maybe try to acclimate them a little bit better. Reese agrees that this is a good idea and he comes to help them move down immediately. So they need to go to the Court of Nightmares and they need to go for two reasons. The first reason is so that Nesta can practice on all the objects of power there and try to see see if she can detect any of the holes in the wall. And the other reason is because they need to call a meeting with Kier because while Moore's father is essentially hated among the inner circle, he does lead that part of Reese's court. And with that comes a whole legion of warriors called the Darkbringers who are uh, gonna be a pretty big help in the war to come. So they need to convince Kier to work with them. So when they get to the Court of Nightmares, they show up in the big throne room that they usually appear in when they get there. And although Feyre has been made High Lady since the last time they got there, they have not added a second throne to their room, which is obviously an insult. The people of the court are kind of iffy about Feyre being High Lady because they immediately start testing her by like poking little tendrils of power over to her and she snaps back real quick. So they go to this council room at the Court of Nightmares and they sit down for a meeting with Moore's father, Kier. He already knows that they want his Darkbringer Legion in the war and he insinuates that there's going to be a price to pay. Somebody else joins them for the meeting and it is Eris. Eris is, first of all, Lucian's brother. He's the eldest son of the High Lord of the Autumn Court. And he is the dickhead who was betrothed to Moor and wound up dumping her and leaving her in the woods to die. Now, apparently his side of that story is a little bit different, but we have not seen any proof of that to be true just yet. Eris is the heir to his father's throne and he does not care much for his father at all. Kier has been wanting an alliance with the Autumn Court for years so that they can all fight together against Highburn. Now, nobody really trusts Eris. However, Eris seems to be against his father and against the rest of his court. Kier is not entirely convinced and he wants a little something more. And what he wants is now that he knows knows what he's missing out there in Valaris. He wants access to the city. Reese anticipated that this would be something that he wanted in this situation, so he prepared in advance, but nobody else knows that Reese prepared for this in advance. And when he agrees to give him access to the city, more is devastated. They also tell Kier that they want the Ouroboros. They don't really explain why, because I don't think that uh, he would be too inclined to agree to give it to them if he knew they were going to release the bone carver but he says that they can have it if they want to because he's got nothing to do with it so long as they can wind up taking it because nobody's been able to take it without losing their mind the meeting ends they go back to the house of wind and more cries and cries and punches reese in the chest and tells him that she can't believe that he did this and reese thinks it's because he's allied with eris because Obviously, she's got a little bit of saltiness left over from that whole situation, but really what she's so upset about is the fact that he offered her dad access to the city. He tries to explain that he actually held a meeting with all of the shop owners and the hotel owners, all of the businesses in the city in advance, that they're not to serve them. So although they would be granted access, they would never have any incentive to go there for any extended period of time, which is smart, but they're really mad that Reese didn't tell them in advance. During this conversation, they also tell Ambrin that they want to release the Bone Carver and use the power that she used to release herself to release the Bone Carver. So they ask her how she did it, and in that, she has to sort of explain how she got there to begin with. So she explains that she's from basically another dimension. And one day in the dimension that she came from, there was a rip in the sky. I think it, they said it was during some sort of a battle or something. Her type of being, whatever it is that Amran really is, they're not supposed to have emotions like curiosity and stuff like they have the basic emotions but they're not supposed to be so human-like and they're never supposed to be like self-serving but 
Amrin was always different. Amrin always had a bit of curiosity to her. So when one day a rip appeared in the sky, she was the one who was inclined to go and look into it. And that's how she wound up in their world. They didn't really say how she wound up in the prison, but the way she got out was by finding a binding spell and binding herself into a fey body. Once she was within this different body, the prison, like the wards and the magic that keep the prisoners inside that prison didn't recognize her anymore and she was able to walk out. But the interesting thing is that once she was in that body, she gained the full spectrum of emotions and thoughts that fairies have. So if she unbound herself and allowed herself to go back to her world, she would probably no longer remember them or feel any of the emotions that she has as basically not a human, obviously, because she's a fairy. Reese tells her that if she wants, she can use whatever spell she finds to unbind herself from the body she put herself in and go back to her own world. As this conversation is progressing, Elaine shows up and they're all very surprised because Elaine hasn't really left her room much at all. And she's still there talking all sorts of weird half riddles. One notable one that she says in this conversation is everyone thinks she's dead, but she's not, she's just different. Oh, and one other important thing that comes up in this conversation is that when Nesta and Amarin had been trying to find weaknesses in the objects of power at the Court of Nightmares, while they were having their meeting with Kier and Eris, she wasn't able to find anything, not a single thing. So after hearing Elaine saying all this weird shit again and not understanding what's going on with her, Feyre decides that it'd be a really good idea to have a healer come see her and just make sure that everything's okay. And she calls on Reese's favorite healer, whose name is Maja. After the heat of the moment has passed, Moore says that she understands why Reese did what he did. Still upset about it, but she gets it. And she knows that unfortunately in times of war, things have to be done that they probably don't like. So thankfully, most of the drama from the night before seems to be settling down. The healer comes to see Elaine and she runs her hands over her. It sounds almost like, like a Reiki kind of a situation. And after checking her over, she concludes that there's really nothing that she can find wrong. But they ask her about the health of Elaine's mind and she says that she can't even get into Elaine's mind because of what Elaine is. So because Elaine is made by the cauldron and her mind is partially of its magic, she can't even get in there to see if there's anything wrong. Her take on things seems to be that Elaine is just healing from trauma and trauma takes different shapes and different people and that eventually she'll be okay and just kind of let her ride it out. But what she suspects is kind of what Feyre had said that maybe Lucian being her mate can be helpful to her. So she suggests that they try to have Lucian help her heal a little bit. So Feyre, sets it up so that she comes down to have tea and biscuits and like a little snack with Lucian and talk and they all sort of like sit not too far away from them as chaperones and let him try to connect with her a little bit and see what happens. Surprisingly, Elaine agrees pretty quickly to come downstairs and have tea with him. So after conversing for a little while and sort of just playing things really, really carefully, Lucian makes a bold move and tries to make, quote unquote, a tug on their bond, which is sort of what Reese did to Farah. She describes it as it sort of feels like something's like tugging on the inside of you. But when Lucian does that, it kind of freaks Elaine out. She doesn't really seem to be comfortable with the fact that he's her mate. And once he does that, she's a little bit too freaked out. She doesn't really want anything to do with him anymore. And that attempt at helping Elaine ends there. About two days later, Feyre is having a flying lesson in the woods with Asriel. She repeatedly flies into trees. I guess flying, it's not an easy task, you know? Asriel tells her a story, and honestly, this is one of my favorite scenes in this whole book. He tells her a story about a fairy named Nithel. Nithel was a fairy in Miriam and Draken's court during the last war. Nithel was a very, very small, petite 
female seraphin and the seraphins are also winged fairies but they have wings like birds rather than wings like bats. She was too small to fight in their aerial legion. One of her wings was slightly deformed and she just couldn't really fly well enough to be in it. Like she couldn't even fly holding up the shield. Her lover was in the aerial legion though so she was like always around. She was always nearby but she was a cartographer. During the war, at the end of the war, the way that Mirian and Draken and their troops had escaped was they had opened up a channel on the ocean floor to let their army pass using magic. But while this was going on, Miriam had succumbed to an attack and was dying, speared through a sword on the ocean floor as it was going to close back up, like they couldn't hold it open with the water anymore. And Nafel, with her tiny, tiny wings, one of them being deformed, was able to pick up Miriam and fly with her and escape with her and save her life. And the entire reason that she was able to do it was not only in spite of the fact that she was small, but because she was small. Because none of the other fairies' wingspan would have fit between the rocks that she had to fly through to get her out. And since the time that happened, Reese, Cassian, and Azriel have adopted the Nefel philosophy for commanding their legions. They tried to be acutely aware that sometimes your greatest weakness can be your strength and that the least likely person could be exactly the person you need to get the job done. When Feyre gets back from her flying lesson, she's super sore. She takes Nesta down to the big library where Clotho works to do some more research about the wall. And Feyre turns to Nesta and finally asks her straight up to her face, Nesta, why do you push everyone away except Elaine? And Nesta opens her mouth to answer, but she's interrupted because somebody comes into the library who is not supposed to be there. They're cornered in the library by two of Highburn's commanders who he calls his ravens. One has black hair and one has white hair. If you recall, or maybe I didn't say this, but I think I did, one of the cryptic things Elaine had been saying was two ravens are coming, one black and one white. So it's starting to look like these things that Elaine is saying are not necessarily just like her being mad, but like some sort of premonitions. She's like Bran, she's like the three-eyed raven, but of this world. Before Feyre can even make a move against these two highborn commanders that show up, they blow a bunch of blue dust in her face which is the infamous Fabian that she had been poisoned with in the past, so it completely cuts off her powers. So Feyre decides that their only choice is to run for it. She tells Nesta to run, and Nesta is like painfully slow because she's super out of shape because she won't train with freaking Cassian. And she decides that instead of trying to run and escape through the upper levels of the library, she's going to run down into the bottom of the library where they will have to face the creature that lives down there. The two highburn commanders chase them down through the levels of the library and the whole way they're like kind of talking shit and mocking them and they start talking about what happened to the human queens after they left. The youngest most beautiful one went into the cauldron first and tried to get transformed but the cauldron was so pissed at what Nesta took from it that it turned the young beautiful queen into an old withered crone and then the other queens were too afraid to go in afterward which gives us our answer about what had happened to the human queens because nobody knew. When they get to the bottom of the library, Feyre tells Nesta to just run and Nesta is hesitant because she doesn't want to leave her sister but she does it anyway and Feyre knocks down a bunch of stacks of books locking off the way so that she's trapped down at the bottom of the library but the highborn commanders can't go back after her sister. There is like feeling her way around in the dark and she finally comes across the monster who lives at the bottom of the library and she tells the monster that she'll make a bargain with him. Which we know in the fairy world, bargains are bound by a quote-unquote very old and very simple magic. 
Feyre asks what he wants in exchange for him killing the Highborn commanders, and he says that he just wants company. Now, lucky for Feyre, he does not make any specific requests, and she agrees to it immediately and gets a new tattoo on her arm, binding her in an agreement to this monster who lives in the library. The monster tells her to close her eyes and starts tearing the two Highborn commanders up, like tearing them to smither. I always use the word smithereens, but he's tearing them to smithereens. There's no other way to say it. As the monster is tearing these two a new butthole and she's got her eyes closed, Cassian and Reese show up. Reese puts up a wall of magic so Feyre can't get back in or see what's going on. And he winds up finishing off the two Highborn commanders himself. When they get back, after they have defeated these two commanders, Reese is absolutely livid that they were able to infiltrate his city and specifically his library, which is kind of like a safe space that he's created for himself and for those priestesses. Like he feels like he has failed everyone. He places a forced curfew on the city for the night and lets Amrin go out hunting to make sure that no other Highburn people, commanders, people who work for him, whatever, have gotten into the city and are like nefariously lurking about. The people of Volaris not only just kind of agree to this and don't even think twice about Amrin going to hunt, but they kind of treat Amrin like some sort of like a god. They leave offerings of blood on their porches and their front doorsteps for her and stuff. That night, Elaine is also saying these like riddly type things again. and. This is when they realize that Elaine has become a seer. She starts talking about a queen of feather and flame, and then they realize that what she had said about the ravens had come true. And once they say that they are understanding that what Elaine is talking about is actually stuff that she's seeing, Elaine starts to kind of shake awake in a way that she hasn't since the cauldron incident. So this kind of like, brings her back. The sixth queen, the one that had been ill, was actually not ill at all as we discussed, but we never found out what happened to her. What Elaine sees in her vision when she sees a queen who is a bird of fire and flame is this sixth queen. And as it turns out, this sixth queen was sold off to some sort of a lord on the continent who has a magic onyx box and he keeps a harem of women who are bound to him in some way. The human queen in question is apparently a woman by night, but a firebird by day. So she has like some sort of a crazy curse on her. More suggests that perhaps because the vision that Elaine had about the two ravens was kind of a warning to them that perhaps the vision she's having of this queen is something that they need to go check out. And Lucian offers to go to the human realm to track down this queen who is a bird of fire and flame. Lucian leaves to go to find the human firebird queen. And for the first time, it sort of seems like Elaine is upset that he's going. Like she seems like she has a little bit of concern. And unfortunately, Lucian doesn't seem to notice this happening. But Feyre does. Feyre sees what's going on. Nesta says that her training has been making small progress and they take that as some good news as well. But just as they think that maybe they may have things under control, Amran storms in and says Adriata is under attack by Hybern. Vera and Reese both agree that they obviously can't let Tarquin fight him off alone. And so they immediately start making moves to go there to help him. And after some short amount of preparation, Moore and Feyre winnow straight to Adriata to join in the battle. And when they get there, shit has already hit the fan. Reese and the others, along with the entire Illyrian army, are there fighting already. They're super outnumbered and there's a lot of Feybane being used against them in this battle as well. She and Moore have been instructed to help defend the palace. The two of them clear the palace pretty quickly. Feyre seems pretty good at this. She's got a lot of tools at her disposal, so it's not surprising. They use a combination of fighting skills that they've learned from Cassian and magic to basically get in there and uh, wreck shop. And as soon as they have a free moment, Feyre tries to contact Reese and make sure that he's okay. Through the bond, his mental shields are heavier and bigger than she has ever seen them be before. And she can't 
get in contact with him. So she pounds and pounds on her side of the bond until he lets her in his mind and she can see through his eyes, but then she's trapped in there. I'm assuming that again, calling back to Bran from Game of Thrones, I feel like they don't really say this or explain what it's like on her end while she's in his mind, but it's gotta be like the way Bran, when he goes off and like sees through the crows, like his eyes roll back into his head and he's just like stuck there. I feel like it's gotta be around the same thing. An important thing of note also is that no other courts have shown up to help. It was only the Night Court who showed up to help them. So she's inside Reese's mind, looking through his eyes. He's on a ship and he's just misting people left and right, which if you don't remember from the first book, misting is basically when one of these lords or one of these really powerful fairies has so much power that they literally really just disintegrate stuff with their mind. And when she's in there, she finds out that there is like some sort of a spell over the battle that's dampening their power. And he's tracking down the source of it to go after it. Most likely it's directly from Highburn himself. So this is a ballsy move. Lo and behold, the king comes out on the deck of this ship where Reese is misting people and Reese faces him head to head. There's a lot of back and forth and talk that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Reese tries to infiltrate the king's mind a few times and like get him that way, but it's almost like he throws his powers at it and like it just goes through the air. As it turns out, the king isn't even there. He used some sort of a spell to like make himself into a hologram. It's like when they did that concert with Tupac. Once the king is gone, Reese mists all the soldiers on the deck of the ship and finally lets Farah out of his mind where she had been trapped for like way too long for it to be safe. So the battle ends, they have essentially won. Feyre and Moore go back to the palace and the first person they run into is Varian. And Varian, who is one of the princes of Adriata, says he's upstairs and Feyre thinks that she means Reese. But when they get upstairs to the council room, it turns out that he meant Tarquin. Now Tarquin still hates them because of Feyre coming there and schmoozing him and then stealing the Book of Breathings. There is still a blood ruby, AKA a death warrant out for Reese, Amran, and Feyre. So when she gets up there, even though they showed up to help them win back Adriata, he's not entirely thrilled to see her. Shortly after Feyre gets up there, Reese also shows up and Tarquin explains that in his opinion, the entire attack is actually Feyre's fault because once Feyre destroyed Tamlin's court, that was when Hybern was able to set up shop in his harbor and attack Adriata from Tamlin's borders. Now that's not entirely untrue, but also Tamlin was the one who decided to side with him. So that's not completely unfair, you know? He tells them he doesn't want any more help from them and to get the hell out of there essentially. But the Illyrians set up camp outside of the city in the hills because they need to get their shit together and like heal their wounded before they can move on. Back at the camp, they all band together to help tend the wounded. Feyre says in light of the fact that Adriata was attacked, they need to move the meeting with the High Lord sooner. So they decide to move the meeting to three days from then. She also knows that Reese is really down in the dumps about everything and she gives him a little bit of a pep talk about what a wonderful person he is and what a good high lord he is. So what Feyre is thinking is that now that Valaris is no longer a secret, that they should just kind of give up the whole evil sinister act and just be themselves at this meeting and like let everybody know who they actually are and the reasons why they should agree to work with them because they're not these monsters. The king knows who they are anyway, and so does everybody else in the court. So like, what is the point of hiding it anymore? But they do agree that they should still conceal her powers because some of the lords, specifically Baron, Lucian's father, the High Lord of the Autumn Court, but others as well, will be upset that she stole this power from them. Although uh, they gave it willingly for the record, she didn't actually steal it. Back in Valaris, Aaron is waiting eagerly for updates. And when they get there, she's got a lot of questions, but she seems more concerned about Varian than anything, which is probably because Varian is like Amran's secret boyfriend. And when they return, Nesta immediately asks, where is he? And they're like, where the hell, what, what are you talking about? Where's who? And she was super concerned about where Cassian was. So aha, Nesta, you do like him. You just admitted it. Just 
keep on admitting it. But more being protective and possibly a little bit jealous is not very nice to her about it. So in a last ditch attempt to get the carver on board, Reese and Farah go back to the prison together to see him again. And Farah immediately tells him, listen, pick another object that you want because I'm not getting the stupid mirror. I'm not doing it. He's like, I don't really desire anything else. And Farah's like, look, pick another object. I'm not getting you that. And he says, would you give me your firstborn? And when he says that, that is when Reese realizes that the little boy that Ferris sees is their future son. And he's like a mix of horrified, but also like kind of like lights up at the idea of it. But the carver will not bend on the whole Ouroboros thing. So they figure it's useless to try to convince him and they leave and as an offering, Reese only gives him a chicken bone this time and he's not pleased with that as an offering. He wants a juicy human bone from a bloody battle or something. They arrive back at the townhouse and when they get there, Elaine is in the kitchen with Nuala and Keridwin, who are the two half wraith cousins of Reese who work as his handmaids. She's in there cooking with them and joking and laughing. And Feyre is elated at the idea that Elaine is acting even remotely normal and even a little bit happy. Six of the seven High Lords have agreed to attend the meeting. The only D-bag that hasn't responded, guess who it is? I'll give you one second to guess who it is. Yeah, you guessed right, it's Tamlin. They've decided that the meeting will be at the Dawn Court because the Dawn Court is like fairy Switzerland. They remain neutral in most things. And geographically, it's also located right in the center of Prithian. Before the meeting, they have to get all, you know, gussied up and ready to go. And Reese takes Fera up to his family trove of jewels to pick out her crown for the meeting. And she's never been in there before. And it is absolutely unbelievably filled with lavish jewelry. It's a dark room that's lit up with little tiny glow worms that crawl along everything and they crawl through the jewelry and they're blue and turquoise and it just sounds so magical. And the last second before they go to leave for the meeting, Nesta surprises them and says that she's coming with them. She says that she decided that she doesn't want to be remembered as a coward. In this moment, Reese offers her a job as his emissary to the human realm because now Feyre as High Lady is no longer filling that position and Nesta is a, basically a shoe in for the job. And so they decide that this meeting will be like the trial basis of her job. Before they leave for the meeting, they all take bets on who will start a fight first at the meeting and how long it will take. And then they head off to the Dawn Court for the meeting and they show up and the Dawn Court is stunning. Every time they go to a new court, it's like more stunning than the last, but just like all in their own different ways. When they show up, Autumn, Summer, and Dawn haven't arrived yet, but everybody's in room to get there. When they get to the room that the meeting is in, first of all, the room sounds so cool. Instead of a table, it's like a big reflection pool filled with water lilies and koi fish that swim through it. And then there's like a band of like table area around the outside that they can eat their food and drinks on. It sounds like the coolest dining room of all time. There are also other winged fairies when they get there. And Reese explains to Feyre that those are the peregrines. They have bird wings as well. They belong with Thyssen, who I'm starting to lose track of what court everyone is from in my mind, because like at this point, we're getting to like Game of Thrones levels of like characters here, but I believe they are winter court. We also meet Helion, who is the High Lord of the Day Court. People of the Day Court, she says, are some of the most beautiful people she's ever seen. However, it's almost like a ruse because their beauty only kind of hides the fact that they're also like top notch as far as knowledge is concerned. They have some of the most expansive libraries and scholars of any of the courts. And the High Lord Helion, his other name is Helion Spellcleaver because he has spent years and years of his life becoming super educated on spells and being able to break them. So his big thing is that he can break wards, break spells, and it's like a 
huge advantage. Helene asks them if Tamlin knows that Ferret is Reese's mate and that she's High Lady and Reese is like, LOL, guess we'll find out. Edwin shows up and ignores them and they're settling down for the meeting. They're getting ready to just dive into the nitty gritty of what needs to happen in this war when out of nowhere, who winnows directly into the room, just interrupting and disrupting damn near everything. Oh, guess. Guess, I'll let you guess again. Yeah, it's Tamlin. Not only did he show up late, but he never even RSVP'd and told them that he was coming. So they don't even have a chair ready for him. Tamlin does not waste any time and just really dives directly into acting like an asshole. He blames Reese for him siding with Highburn because he says he would never have to have done it if Reese didn't steal his bride, which First of all, we all know that Feyre was gonna leave him anyway. Second of all, I don't know, Tamplin. Sounds like maybe that wasn't the only answer. Sounds like maybe treason wasn't your only option, but that's just my opinion. And then he finds out that she's High Lady and he says, wow, well, I could have saw that coming because one time you asked me if you would be High Lady in my court. And why would you stay in my court and serve when you could be in his court and rule? Insinuating that she's using Reese for power, which obviously we know is not the case. But you know what? It's understandable that Tamlin is salty, but still, I hate him. Tamlin goes on a long, long, annoying speech, basically trying to spin the narrative and make it look like Reese and the Night Court are probably the ones that everybody should be concerned about and that maybe they're siding with Highburn for all they know. He makes a pretty solid attempt at spinning his side of the story, but unfortunately for him, unfortunately for everybody else, nobody really believes him and Helian tells him to shut up that he's getting tedious. And at one point, Tamlin is going on for so long talking shit that Reese jumps into his mind and literally takes his voice away. Somebody's gotta get really annoying for you to do that. But it actually works out for the best because Reese can tell them at that point like, hey, this is just a gentle reminder that if I wanted to, I could jump into all of your minds and convince you to do my bidding. But instead, I'm here talking to you in a meeting. So obviously my intentions are good. Tarquin asks Reese why he came to help Adriata, even though Tarquin had had a blood ruby out for him. And Reese said, I thought that's what friends do. And at that point, although Tarquin was still upset with them after they helped at Adriata, he decides to rescind the blood rubies, even though they do say that Emrin wants to keep hers. Tamlin tries to convince everybody that he is indeed willing to fight for Prithian. Even though he had previously seemed like he was siding with Highburn, he says that he just did it out of desperation, uh, that he never would have done it if he didn't think that it was the only way to get Farah back and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Nobody really believes him. Ironically, the only one who believes him to start with is Reese. Autumn Court also reveals that they know that Elaine is Lucian's mate, which is probably not great because they're not very fond of Lucian, except the mother. The mother seems to still love Lucian. Eris is trying to hide the fact that he had already met with them. So they have to kind of keep up this ruse that they haven't seen each other in 500 years. He says that after 500 years, Moore still dresses like a slut and Asriel loses his mind, he attacks him with magic, somehow breaking the spells that they have on the meeting so that people can attack each other. And he locks them inside of his own shield. So so that nobody can get in and stop him from beating up Eris. Reese tells him to stop and he won't even listen to his high lord and stop. The only way that he stops is Feyre walks up to his shield and gently stands by it and tells him to please stop and like calls him away and he listens to her. Funny enough, it seems like the other cores had been placing bets on who was gonna fight first too, so it wasn't just them who knew before they went into this meeting. One of the issues that they have fighting off Hybern is the fact that he has all of this Fabian, which negates their powers and essentially gives them a huge disadvantage in battle. So Tarquin, as a thank you for the Night Court coming to save them, offers to go and attempt to destroy the entire cache of Fabian, but Thiessen stops him and says that it's unnecessary because one of his master tinkerers was able to find an antidote for it. So he brings in this master tinkerer whose name is Nuan. We find out that Nuan is actually the woman who made Lucian's eye. 
She says that she's developed a powder that they can ingest, which will negate the effects of fabine, that they have to take it orally, and also that it won't protect against objects made of it. So for example, if they had like a war hammer made of fabine and they hit one of their shields with it, it would still break the shield. It just wouldn't stop the fairies from having power. The only one who doesn't agree to take the antidote or give it to his soldiers is Baron, because quite frankly, Baron's just difficult, but Eris says that he'll take it, which kind of sways his court in that direction. And Baron goes ahead and starts talking shit to Feyre and calling her a whore and all of this stuff. She snaps at this meeting and she attacks Baron with her powers, which they've agreed is not a good idea because they're supposed to be hiding the fact that she has these powers from the other high lords. But in the heat of the moment, man, sometimes shit happens. So she like traps Baron in a bubble of water and is like drowning him inside of this bubble and he's trying to get out. It's a whole mess. Eventually, Reese gets her to leave him alone and he's about to leave the meeting. He doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. Feyre gives a speech about how they all need to band together on this and she convinces everybody but Baron. Baron takes off with the rest of his court and they go home. The rest of the lords stay there though and start discussing plans for battle, but none of them really want to talk about the logistics of things and how many troops they have in front of Tamlin because they're still a little bit worried that Tamlin is like pretending to be on their side, but he's really still working with Hybern. They all decide to stay the night in the palace at the Dawn Court and then reconvene in the morning to continue talking about plans. So they go back to the suite of rooms that the Dawn Court has provided them. And when they get back there, Helion shows up. And Helion apparently for years has been trying to get more Cassian and Asriel to have a foursome with him and they've never done it. But apparently he kind of puts on a show and like a character the way Reese does as well. Well, the way Reese did, he was himself at this meeting. Oh, and something I forgot to mention that was important. At this meeting, Reese showed up for the first time with his wings showing. He never has revealed his wings to the other Lords of the High Courts before. Helion tells a bunch of stories that kind of make him seem like he's not really all that different from Reese. He tells a whole story about how he was once in love with and had an affair with Lucian's mom. And as he's telling this story, Feyre looks at him and realizes that he's Lucian's real dad. The timing lines up and when she looks at his face, all of his features look just like Lucian, which explains a lot of things about why Lucian is not like his brothers, why Lucian doesn't really look like his brothers. Like he does look like he's from the autumn court, but he's got like tanner skin and he just looks different than the rest of them. While Baron would never admit that he knows that that's the case, it does make sense that he would secretly deep down hate him for that. I know I'm making a lot of Game of Thrones references in this particular portion of the book, but this kind of makes Lucian like the Jon Snow. She tells Reese through the bond what she thinks and he sees it immediately and says, holy burning hell. And he thinks that she's so right that he's actually mad that he hadn't seen it sooner. And what that also means, because Helion has never had children, is that Lucian could actually be Helion's sole heir. Nessa barges into the room very upset and says that they have to leave, that something's not right. She's like, I feel this overwhelming sense of dread and I just can't put my finger on what it is, but something is terribly wrong. So Reese, Cassian and Asriel go out and like do some investigating and see whether or not there's like a trap set up for them or there's some kind of a spell being put over them and they find nothing. So they decide that they're gonna stay anyway, even though Nesta insists that they should leave. More winds up spending the night with Helion and Feyre is really concerned that Asriel is going to be upset about it, but Reese tells her not to worry about it, that they've both taken lovers before and it's not ever been like a really big issue. The next day they reconvene the meeting. More looks really unhappy in the morning, which Feyre was surprised by because like, you know, you would think that like, you know, you had like a fun hookup the night before that you would look happy, but she looks like void and empty and upset. And Feyre just makes note of it, wondering why that's the case. They go to the meeting and before they even get into it, Nesta says that she doesn't feel well and she collapses on the floor. She's shaking and she's hot and she just keeps saying something is wrong. And they're like, well, what is it? What's the matter? What do you feel? And she's like, it's not me. It's not something wrong in me. There's something in the cauldron. Stand by, I gotta put lipstick on. Can't talk while I put on lipstick. 
a huge boom shoots through the room. And once the shaking is over, Reese sends his powers out into the world to look around and finds that Highburn has used the cauldron to attack the wall and it's completely gone. They're too late to find a way to fortify the wall because it's completely gone. They all decide to cut the meeting short, get back to their respective courts and get ready to go to war. Go back to the night court and Ferret asks Amrin, hey, do you know about the creature in the library? And Amrin's like, yeah, I sure do. What the hell do you wanna know that for? She says his name is Ryaxis and Feyre is like, well, you and I are gonna go pay Ryaxis a visit. Feyre has a sneaky idea. She wants Amrin to come with her to see Ryaxis because she is going to try to offer the offer that she gave to the bone carver to him instead to get him to fight in the battlefield with them. Amrin has to come with her because Amrin is the one who can break the spells that hold Ryaxis in the library. So they go to the library and approach this strange creature. He's basically like, he's not even a monster. He's almost like a spirit. He doesn't have a completely physical form, but they can still feel him around them and like see like tendrils of mist and power. And to Farah's shock, when they make him the offer, just like the bone carver, he doesn't want to be freed. He's another prisoner who has come to love the prison that he lives in. But thankfully, what Ryaxis wants in exchange is a lot simpler than what the bone carver wants. He literally just wants a window in the library to let sunlight and moonlight in. So she gets another tattoo of a bargain and now she is double bargained up with the monster who lives at the bottom of the library. They leave the library and Favorite goes back to the townhouse and tells Reese what she did. Reese is like, okay, I guess the library monster is on our side cool and then they have a conversation they get dressed together and they're about to leave to go off to fight this war as they're about to winnow out to the war camp to get ready reese takes Farah's hand and says i wonder if we'll see this again they take each other's hands and they winnow off to war and that is where we leave off again today and i don't know if this book is just filled with cliffhangers or if I'm just really good at picking the spots where the cliffhangers are gonna be, but we got left on a cliffhanger again. I can't even believe it. So that is it for this section of the book. In the next episode, we will discuss from this point, chapter 50 through the end of the book. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what did you think of this section? It felt to me like this section wasn't so much filled with action and craziness, but like more like pieces coming together and like all of the parts of everything that need to happen in the story clicking into place in order to push it forward, you know? But I did like the little plot twists about possibly Lucian being Healy and Sun, and we did find out a lot of interesting stuff. We got interesting backstories like the Nefel philosophy and all that stuff. So I really enjoyed this little section, even though it wasn't the most action packed of the bunch. Leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you thought. Please don't forget to leave a like on this video if you don't mind taking a moment to do that because I would really appreciate appreciate it. I especially appreciate it on this series. It lets me know that you guys are still enjoying this if you don't feel like being vocal or leaving a comment about it, which is very helpful for me. And if you are new around here, if you want to be a part of this little book club, or if you just want to hang around for more makeup tutorials and stuff like that, please go ahead and subscribe because I would love to have you stick around for all of that. If you want to keep up with in between videos, I'm at Miss Quinface over on Instagram. You can find me over there posting all different kinds of lip art and more intricate makeup looks and I post on my stories a lot. We unbox PR over there and I would love to have you there for that as well. That's all for today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me while I did my makeup and discussed this fun little book series. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate each and every one of you and I will see you in the next one.